people who work at remote places like forest officers, oil rig workers, etc. What creepy things have you noticed while at work? Please, if you like our videos, share and subscribe. Our channel Thread Tonic. Part 1 Account 1, I worked at a public forest. One day we had someone report a dead animal on the side of one of our trails. A few of us from the front desk hiked out to see what it was. It looked like a giant piece of liver, maybe. Just a pile of smooth red meat, no blood around, and it was wrapped up in a t-shirt with some coins scattered around it. We called our rangers to go check it out, and one of them was pretty sure it was a placenta. The weird part is, you have to check in through a front desk. So someone either snuck a placenta liver in or gave live birth, removed an organ on our trails. We never got an answer on what the pile of meat was, how it got there, or why. Account 2. I work on North Sea oil rigs on an ad hoc basis off the coast of Scotland. Wouldn't say anything was particularly paranormal creepy, but it can be very unsettling. Weird place. Fog can come rolling in out of nowhere, and other rigs you can see off the sides can disappear in front of your eyes. Sometimes you can't see the walkway 6FT in front of you, or if you're walking over grading, you can't see the sea below your feet, about 60 main hours down from feck to sea, but you can hear it, albeit muffled. The fog can roll in over the course of a few minutes too, so a perfectly clear day becomes pea soup. You can also feel the rig moving, swaying on high winds, rough seas, even though it's a fixed leg platform. Very unnerving to feel your office swaying when it shouldn't be. My last trip was my first ever night shift, and I found it particularly unsettling as you've got the background noise of the plant. But I walked around the whole rig without seeing another living soul for the whole shift. Usually there are about 130 people on board, although smaller rigs have smaller head counts. Usually once a trip I'm hit by this awareness that you are just very isolated and in the middle of nowhere. Most rigs I've worked on are an hour's chopper ride from land. So if things go wrong, it can escalate very quickly. Account 3. During college that was located away from major cities, the woods were all around us. That being said, there was a highly rated trail, the Loyal Sock Trail, which was about an hour drive from the university. I invited a friend to come with me as he had never been on an extended backpacking trip. A 50-mile trail that we intended to backpack over the four-day weekend. I am an Eagle Scout who has spent countless hours in the woods and went on backpacking trips consistently throughout my college experience. As many have said before me, you get used to the minor spooky things happening. Coyote howls, raccoons in the middle of the night, even the occasional unknown noise. The scariest thing to find in the woods, however, are people. We were about 20 miles into the trail. And being Pennsylvania, where the underbrush and trees line the trails pretty densely, I always walk about 100 meters off of the trail to reduce the chances of me disturbing people. People disturbing me especially in the early morning when I choose to sleep in. Following that same strategy, my friend and I go out of our way to be in this amazing spot, a good ways off of the trail where it would even be difficult to see our flashlights from the trail. This spot was on a peninsula where a creek met a river, meaning there was only one way into our camp and only one way out. We start a fire, cook our food, and drink some, but not enough to get either of us drunk. We put the fire out about midnight and head into our individual tents. All is quiet. It is the fall semester, so leaves are on the ground. The moon is brightly shining through the bare trees, and the air is cool. The only noise is the occasional time when I would hear my friend turn over in his sleep. Then I hear the voices. The voices sounded very close for being on the trail 100 meters away. I check my watch 3 a.m. Who hikes at 3 a.m.? We are 20 miles in. I slowly get out of my sleeping bag, slowly unzip my tent, only to see my friend peeking out of his tent in the exact same fashion. He quickly moves his finger over his mouth in an exaggerated hush signal, then use the same hand to frantically motion towards the way of the trail. Then we see them, four adults, three men and one woman, walking directly towards our camp, no lights illuminating their path. They are walking silently at this point. Only one of them has a backpack. An impossibility for the long hike they were 13 of the way through. Being a long trip, you bring wood-cutting supplies to chop branches into smaller branches to burn. For me, this was a survival knife. Grabbing the knife, believing it is my only way of defending myself, I am more disheveled than I ever have been. Especially knowing that a knife is barely defense at all. 
These people walk into our site, sit down by our extinguished fire pit, and just sit there for what felt like an eternity. My friend speaks up and asks what they are doing in our campsite. Without answering the question, they ask if we have any food. Having packed as lightly as possible for the long trip, we had only a few extra Mountain House MRE-style meals. I grab one out of my bag and toss it to one of the men. In rapid succession, I ask why they aren't using a light, if they need help finding the trail, and why they are hiking so late. They respond with the following. We don't use lights. We know where the trail is. It is better to hike late at night. Unnerved at this point, my friend asks them to leave. They respond by asking if we want to light the fire and hang out for a bit. No, we do not. They grab their bag, get up, and leave without speaking another word. We watch them leave and take shifts making sure that they didn't come back. Needless to say, we both got very little sleep that night. When the sun rose the next morning, we finally got real sleep. By the afternoon, when we woke up, it all felt like a weird dream of sorts. The only evidence was a fuzzy cap that they must have dropped that I have to this day. I have never had something as weird spooky as that happen in the woods and hope to never have it happen again. In the eight years since that trip, I haven't been back to the Loyal Sock Trail. Account 4. I do a lot of stream work, so I spend time out in pretty rural areas walking streams and rivers. Once my co-worker and I were working in a more urban environment and came across what we initially thought was a body, which of course triggered oh shit from us, but it ended up being a firefighter's dummy that had fallen down a hill. We felt pretty dumb. Other notable things include a small grave in the middle of nowhere for someone's dog, pretty sad, and a stuffed rabbit with shotgun shells placed where its eyes should be, a mannequin very purposely placed in a chair in the middle of the woods, and lots of little random altars. I also did work in Myrtle Beach, what a hellhole, and accidentally walked into an inhabited homeless camp. I was peering into a stormwater grate when I looked up and saw a homeless person standing in his shelter, staring at us and saying nothing. I felt like I was trespassing, so we quietly left. Account 5. Used to be a supervisor for a janitorial company, and a couple of times a week I had to go to a middle school and clean their hallway floors and gymnasium with a Zamboni-type vehicle that mopped and scrubbed the floor. When I was there, I had the whole school to myself. Used to get finished quickly and go to the library and read while eating my dinner. Well, one morning after being there, I get a call from school security and they want me to come in. When I get there, I see a police car too. Uh-oh, I think. They ask me a few questions like, Did you notice anything out of the ordinary or strange while you were here last night? No, I hadn't. Usually have headphones in. Security then shows me camera footage of someone breaking into one of the classrooms while I was riding the Zamboni not far away. I was there for another two hours. Nothing was stolen. But the worst part was they didn't have footage of the person leaving. They didn't go out the way they came in, and police had to sweep the entire school. Never did find out what happened with that one. Account 6. On our drill ship that was built in China, we noticed on the drawings there was a room. We went to look at it and couldn't find an entrance, but the spacing was obvious there was an extra room. It might not sound so creepy unless you've been in these shipyards where two things are known to happen. Stowaways, although I doubt it in this case, but also hundreds of workers at any given time following orders blindly. So we confirmed that the room had all six sides, yet not a single weld on the outside. There is only one way this could have happened, and I'm sure you're starting to get it now. They must have welded from the inside for this room, and then realized they had no way out upon completion if the gases didn't kill them first. It's extremely heavy around that room. People say they hear things. I have definitely. This isn't some old ship either. I rode this ship from China to Amsterdam after completion and then the maiden voyage to America. I guess it happens quick. Account 7. When I was 15 years old, I was doing my 4 a.m. newspaper delivery round on a bicycle. I was driving into the garden of this one subscriber where I saw two guys with flashlights looking through the windows of the house. I was a bit in shock and just said, good morning, guys. They were just as much in shock and an awkward silence followed. I tried to break the silence by asking if I could pass them to deliver the newspaper through the door. One of the guys said the person living in that house did something to his family, and they took it as an opportunity to get away in their car that was still running. When they were gone, I rang the doorbell at the house to tell them what happened and they should keep an eye out. 
Account 8. We were wrapping up for the day in northern Canada. I am fueling up the side boom. I'm all by myself at this point because I was tired of listening to the laborers whine of the cold, so I told them I would take care of the rest. Think bulldozer with no blade but a giant metal boom on the side that we use to raise and lower pipe. It's February, so pitch black. I keep hearing some weird sound. I can't quite hear it because the pump is too loud. I search around a couple of times and see nothing. I get in the truck and take off, drive past the front of the side boom to see a cougar sitting on top of a dirt pile 15 feet away. The damn thing was just watching me there and probably could have ended me without me even realizing it. I've never seen a cougar in the wild before, and it's hard to understand just how big they are and how powerful until you see one up close. That thing leaped off the 6FT pile and probably didn't touch ground for 1520FT. It's terrifying to think something so big and powerful could just be sitting there deciding if they want to make you dinner. Account 9. I'm not sure this counts, but I'm a teacher at an urban public school and was at work late grading and getting ready for the next day. Time had kind of flown by, and before I knew it, it was 7 p.m. I start packing up to leave in a building that is, in theory, locked and empty besides me when our Alice alarm goes off, indicating an armed intruder in the building. I am one, alone two, young three, freaked AF because I am absolutely not ready to fight a gunman over my lesson plans. I book it out of the school and dive into my car, hearing the alarm blaring the entire time. I peel out of the parking lot and can see in my rear view the alarm lights still flashing and debate never going back, cause fuck that Lomeo. Turns out they were doing routine maintenance and didn't send out an email to the teachers. Account 10. My mom used to live in a small town in the Cascade Mountains and worked as a forest ranger. The creepiest thing that happened was when the oldest male ranger kept hitting on her and trying to get her to come home with him. Not very out of the ordinary, but many years later after she'd left the town, she found out he had been convicted of manslaughter and had killed a young female ranger right before she got hired. She would have probably been his next target. Account 11. I'm a little late to this thread, but I hope this doesn't get buried because this story still haunts me. I worked as the county historic preservationist in southern Appalachia, working on the buildings and properties the county owned. One of the benefits included with my job was living on site at one of the historic properties. The historic house was an imposing brick mansion built in the 1810s, and I lived in a small caretaker's house about 20 feet away. This was in the backwoods, so to deter trespassing and vandalism, the county had built an eight-foot-tall fence around the entire five-acre parcel and put barbed wire on top of the fence. I mention this all just to show it was basically impossible for anyone, or anything, to jump or climb over the fencing. One night, after working late at another property, I pulled up to my entrance gate, let myself in, locked it behind me, and then drove the 100 yards down the gravel road to my house. There were no lights on the property, so I could only see by my headlights. As I turned my car around the corner of one of the outbuildings and parked it, my lights shone on a thing that I still have a hard time describing effectively. It was the size of a deer, but with long, spindly legs and long, shaggy hair. Almost like a taller manned wolf, if you've ever seen pictures of one of those. That alone shook me as there was no way something of that size should have been able to get through or over my fencing. What follows is absolutely true. I got out of my car to get a better look at what the hell the thing was, and as I opened the door and got out, the thing took off running away, not on four legs, but on two. I literally watched this thing raise its back up, stand at full height on its back legs, and sprint away. I absolutely freaked out at that point, grabbed my mag light and my shotgun from inside, and tried to find the thing again. There was no trace, no tracks or anything. I have no idea how it got in OR out of my property. I didn't sleep at all that night, just sat on my couch with my shotgun watching my front door, hoping that whatever I saw didn't come back and burst in. I cannot explain what the hell I saw that night, but it still raises the hair on my neck every time I think about it. Account 12. My oldest brother used to work the overnight sprinklers on a golf course. He took me out one time just for fun, and as we were driving uphill on a fairway, a figure of a lady appeared in the headlights at the top of the hill. My brother steered a little to the left of her and kept driving right on by. I stared right into her eyes as we drove by, and she stared back. Her eyes glowed like a cat in the night. As soon as we were out of voice range, I asked my brother, 
What the hell was that? He calmly responded, Yay, she lives on the golf course and likes to terrorize the workers from time to time. I usually see her out here once a week. All right, cool. Account 13. I've been fishing out in the Gulf of Mexico where they have some oil rigs. This rig wasn't being used from what we knew, so we would get pretty close to it to fish for Red Snapper. While we were out there, we could have sworn we heard screams of a woman over and over. It was some shit. But the explanation was the wind making the noises as it blew through the rig. Well, that's what we were told, but it totally creeped us the fuck out. Account 14. I work as a polar bear guard. As in, I escort people across tundra and mountains and protect them from polar bears. I once saw a snowman totem with reindeer antlers coming out of his head. It was deformed, full of bullet holes and rather creepy. Account 15. There was one time when I was going to the gym at six in the morning. Because, oh, it's just to the gym, I wasn't going to bring a gun. Then I got an alert on my phone saying a bear was in the area so I decided to stay in bed and eat Maltesers. It later turned out that the bear was on my route to the gym at the exact time I would have been walking down without a gun. And it was dark and snowy, so I would definitely have been an entree for the bear. That was off duty, though. On duty, there's not really been any close calls. Just the occasional, Hey, look, everyone. There's a bear way over there. Have a look through my binoculars. Also, just be a bit more alert. The rule is that if it is within 300 meters, I prepare to shoot it. If it is within 100 and coming towards me, that's when I really regrettably have to shoot it. I don't want to shoot a bear, and so far I haven't had to. I hope I never do. Part 2 Account 1 I used to work in a ship, and were usually gone 3 to 10 months at a time. I worked night shift. So this meant I would sleep in the sleeping quarters during daytime with either just me or a handful of other crew members, where usually there'd be 20 to 30 of us in there. It wasn't so bad. Actually, I really liked because it's a lot more peaceful sleeping during the day. You don't hear anybody else snoring or someone's footsteps because they have to piss or something like that. All you can hear is the light creak of the walls and the floors of the ship, and all you can feel is the sway of it on the ocean— a bit haunting and creepy if you really think about it, but I like it. All that ended when there was a short period of time was literally only two of us in there. Or at least that's what I thought. I started hearing light taps across the room. At first they were light taps. Then it would get a bit faster, sometimes it'll get a bit louder, I'd ignore it if it wasn't so utterly annoying. I look at where the other guy is sleeping, and he seems to be fast asleep, accompanied by his light snoring, second day. There it goes again. I tried to follow the sound, but for some reason it bounced around the room like an echo. Eventually it comes to an abrupt halt, so I try to sleep it off. During work at night, I tried to ask my mate about it, but he said he was too tired to even notice. I guess I'm alone on this pursuit. Third day, I take my pursuit one step further by not sleeping right away. I'd be fully awake when it starts, so I'll have a better chance of discovering the source. There it goes again. This time I go from one empty rack to the next until finally it was loud as fuck. Tapping in progress. My heart was thumping like a jackhammer. I pulled the curtain to the side. There laid the biggest dude I'm ever seen on the ship, holding his dick mid-stroke. You have no idea the speech I prepared for this guy, in my head, for keeping me up for several days, but at that exact moment I had no idea what to say. Of course, I gave out a small yelp, which didn't help the situation. I never thought I'd be locking eyes with another dude while he's gripping his dong when I began this honorable pursuit. With the current situation, I mustered my best attempt at displaying my annoyance. It somehow came out as an apology, followed by, I keep hearing tapping noises. He hadn't said anything yet, but at that exact moment, I realized that his elbow, that which belonged to the fapping arm, is resting right on the wall, probably banging on it over and over and over. I didn't wait for a reply. I nodded my head, kind of rolled my eye, and walked away. It will never be easy trying to avoid a big guy like him every day in the same sleeping quarters. Account 2. When I was a kid living in Queensland, Australia, I used to... Bush bash meaning walk off the beaten track through thick scrub, I knew the national park my house backed onto like the back of my hand. I knew from the topography where I was at all times, both my parents were ex-military and had a sort of hands-off, 
trusting me even as young as 12 to venture off on my own into the wilderness so I could just pack a lunch and my sister and neighborhood friend would come with. We'd head off early in the morning, returning just before sunset usually. Once when I, the oldest, was about 14, we had been following creek beds and bashing over heavily forested hills towards an area I'd never been. We came down a hill through a gully full of ferns and followed a dry creek bed for another hour. The sides of the creek became steep and rocky. Before long, we were passing through a gorge. As we emerged from the gorge, we noticed what looked like a dwelling. Being idiot kids, we wanted to see what was up. It looked abandoned at first, but as we got closer, we saw that tarps had been affixed to the ramshackle structure. Chicken. Wire surrounded what looked like a pen just outside. As my eyes traveled across it, I suddenly caught another pair of eyes looking directly back at me. A Rottweiler. We started slowly edging back away from the property, but it was too late. The dog started going nuts and, worried that it was coming after us, or at least alerting the persons living in the hut, we bolted. I went back to the area a few times, but not too close to the abode itself, and found discarded bones from small game and other bits and pieces, spent. Twenty-two casings and such. As an adult and knowing the area, it's very likely we stumbled across either a homeless person camping out or a meth lab. As the area, as I would find out as an adult, was absolutely riddled with meth labs. Account 3 some friends and I were fishing a small pond just after dark for catfish. We started to hear sounds coming off the water like someone throwing softball-sized rocks, but they were coming from all over the pond. We thought someone was messing with us, and we called out a few times for them to stop, but we eventually got freaked out and left. Cut to a few years later. I'm fishing a different pond and hear the same sound. Turns out it was a beaver slapping its tail on the water to drive me from its territory. When beavers become problems in rivers, they relocate them to ponds in town. Account 4. Spent a summer in Wyoming going to BLM land and other remote locations collecting data on bats and herpetofauna. Heard a lot of weird noises like mountain lions screaming, deer snorting, what sounded like owls fighting. Woke up one morning to find two bull moose sleeping 20 yards behind my tent. All of this was part of the job until one night a truck was driving towards us when we were on a BLM square in the southwestern part of the state. The truck was going overland, no road, and was slowly driving at us. It stopped about 100 yards away, turned off the lights, and we could see a person get out. They walked a full circle around us at 100 yards away, got back in the truck, and turned around. This was after dark, and this shadowy figure did a complete circle around us. You could hear them walking through the sagebrush, and I'm sure they could hear us talking. We packed up after that and drove to a hotel an hour away. I called the office and told them I was taking a gun when we went back out. Didn't like having the bear mace as our only defense, edit. BLM stands for Bureau of Land Management. Account 5 I work for a power company restoring power after a storm, was working when a lady came up complaining that her power went out. We explained to her that's why we were there and she should have power back soon. She said, oh, good. My son went down in the basement and now I can't find him. I went with her with a flashlight down the road to a rundown house that was partially caved in. She walked inside and I went to follow. As soon as I walked into the door, she disappeared from my sight and I called for her multiple times. No one responded, so I ran back to our work truck to call for help. A man that was living on her street called to me asking what's wrong, and I told him the situation. He looked at me with a cold stare and said a mom and her son died in that house four years ago. I'm still shook to this day. Account 6. I used to work in the Gulf of Mexico on oil rigs for years, and it may not exactly be creepy, but I found it really unsettling. In deep, open water, the water itself is really clear, so everyone can plainly see all the tuna and barracudas hanging around the rig waiting for the onboard cook to throw off whatever food waste he needs to. Every once in a while, a huge, great white shark would swim up from underneath and snatch a tuna, and it really took like less than a second. They're really scary. Account 7. I worked for a guy that spearfished underneath the rigs out in the Gulf. 
He said it was perfect since there were tons of fish underneath, and the sharks would never go between the legs, just wait for a fish to leave. Plus, the view was amazing, looking down and seeing nothing but abyss. He loved it. I can only imagine how scared I would be. Account 8. Spent a summer doing conservation work out in the absolute middle of nowhere in Wyoming. Was part of a crew that would spend two weeks camping in remote places to do manual labor in places machines couldn't get to. For this story, we were building new hiking-biking trails in the back portion of a designated wilderness area in a high-altitude desert. This means that the nearest civilization was a two-hour car ride to a town of 41 people in a sandy soil area where tracks last forever. It was the middle of our stint during the early part of the night where everyone else had gone to bed, but I stayed up to read. So maybe 11.30 or so. Still pitch black outside, clouds had covered stars. So my headlamp was probably the only light on in a 40-mile radius. Suddenly I hear footsteps walking around our camp and head towards the tents from where I was in the community tent. That sound immediately put me on edge as I felt the hair on my arms raise and my adrenaline spike. I recall thinking to myself that two things are very wrong since the person was not using a light to see and the footsteps were not coming towards me from the tents. Rather, it was the opposite. Within the four seconds it took me to drop my book, get up, and turn the corner of the tent to cast my light on the sleeping tents. The sound had stopped, but I saw tracks in dirt before me. Looked like they came from one end of camp, looked into my tent, walked through the sleeping tents, and kept going out of camp again. I don't know if I was making too much noise or not by walking around, but the rest of my crew ended up waking up and asking me what was going on from inside their tents. After explaining what I found, they all got up to look at the boot prints in the dirt. They were damn near perfect copies of my own boots except for one small thing. I had a rock stuck in my treads that messed up the symmetry. I was wearing fairly common work boots, except I also happened to wear U.S. size 15 double wide boots, so there was no way in hell this was one of the other crew members. I don't think any of us slept much that night. Never saw or heard anything more after that night. A light rain removed the tracks a couple days later, but I do remember none of us were willing to step on the prints themselves and choose to step over them like cracks in the sidewalk. Account 9. Really depends on your current living situation. I currently work for the USDA. I would recommend any of the government organizations, federal or state, if you can afford the smaller paycheck but the stable schedule is more important to your lifestyle, Switched from private industry when we had our first kid. The private industry is where all the money is. But you'll need a degree to advance past entry level. Also, be prepared for travel. One thing I will say is, don't skip over the energy sector. Oil, mining, gas, coal, and all the others are heavily regulated, which means they stay on top of environmental issues and have positions to manage such things. If you like over time... Looking into hazmat or emergency response companies can give you interesting stories. I particularly enjoyed fishing and hydrous ammonia tanks out of flood water with a crane for two weeks. I won't name specific companies since they are all different based on location. Account 10. I'd like to think it was a bear just sitting there smoking while trying to find a way to get to the snacks dangling in the air. I don't like to think what was going through that guy's head as he stood there watching the hunter sleep in a bag tent. Account 11. My parents live pretty far back in the country and have one neighboring house. The neighbors would let their basset hound outside for about 10 minutes to use the bathroom every morning. One morning they let him out and he didn't come back inside. After a couple minutes, they walked out to his favorite bathroom spot and found his head, judging from the tracks. A mountain lion had ambushed him and apparently torn his head off before carrying the body away. What I thought was the creepiest part was that the family hadn't heard a sound. Account 12. I spent several seasons working at a remote field camp in Antarctica, over 1,000 kilometers from the main station in McMurdo. Every once in a while, a squaw bird or Antarctic tern would accidentally end up following one of the small planes, Twin Otter, out to our camp. Once there, though, they'd basically be stranded with no way to get back to the coast. I'd get out of my tent some mornings and see a lonely tern circling overhead, knowing it was a dead bird flying. 
it was quite creepy. Along these lines, when birds or seals do die down there, it's so cold and dry that their bodies don't decay either. They essentially mummify outside McMurdo at Scott's Discovery Hut. There is still a perfectly preserved seal carcass from 1912 sitting by the entrance of the hut. Account 13. I also worked out on the ice at Bird Surface Camp, traveled 1,200 kilometers for shallow core work and one of the recon cores for Weyaz, Itay's program UNH, Maine. We had a skua show up one day while we were on Traverse, had not seen it prior, and it was not at the camp. It was eerie seeing him so far out there. Almost as eerie as seeing the abandoned radio tower sticking up out of the ice at Bird, from the detonated and abandoned Cold War station they had, having left in a hurry, they allowed the station to be covered in ice, and eventually detonated the entrance when following, years visitors to Bird Surface Camp were going inside to check out the old camp. Account 14. I've worked in Canada's north for a few years now in oil and gas. It's pretty creepy when during night shift you realize a moose has just been standing at the tree line, staring you down for an unknown length of time, or finding bear tracks crossing the tracks you just made five minutes ago. Honestly, the silence of a snowy forest in the dead of night, one hundreds of kilometers away from anything, is pretty spooky. When your only contact to the outside world is a radio channel nobody's listening to, you feel pretty alone. Account 15 I was the creepy occurrence. I live on a ranch off of a quite dirt road, our distant neighbors. Nearest house is about one mile away as the crow flies. Have had issues with people stealing things out of their out, buildings and storage sheds in the area. It was also late in the year, so it was starting to get dark around 6 p.m. So, as a result, every time I would see headlights go down our road, I would watch to make sure they weren't stopping on the property. One evening, I see a vehicle going very slowly down the road and come to a stop at the end of our driveway. About 120 yards from our front porch, the vehicle is parked right in front of a 60S pickup I have parked. So I think whoever it is might be looking to steal it, or just looking over the property. Whatever the case, I decide to put on a black coat and grab my rifle to go investigate. It's dark out, so I stay out of the headlights of the vehicle so I can get close. I can tell it is a white van, but I don't see anything else distinguishing about the van. When I'm about 50 yards away, the van backs up and turns into our driveway. I freeze as the headlights wash across me standing in the middle of my driveway, and I see the reflective FedEx logos on the side of the van. Needless to say, the FedEx driver probably shit his pants as he suddenly sees a dark figure standing in the middle of a field, in the dark, holding a rifle. Surprisingly, after I try to give a friendly wave and smile, he continues up the driveway to the house, and I get to explain the situation, and we both have a laugh. So that's how I got to be the creepy guy in some FedEx delivery driver's story. Part 3 Account 1 I work on large ships. If you get a clear view of a hall or passage that runs the whole length, you can actually see the whole ship warp and twist with the sea. If the passage isn't very well lit, it can look like a scene from a horror movie. Account 2. I was a tutor for an elementary school where I would pull out advanced reads and conduct a book club of sorts to encourage kiddos that were ahead of their classmates to still find interest in reading, LOL. This was around the time when school shootings were getting really rampant in the U.S. a couple years ago. So there I am alone with five third graders joking around and having book club in the empty classroom I was allowed to use, all of a sudden, an alarm goes off and an announcement is made that there is an active shooter on campus and we must lock our doors and conduct active shooter protocol. I lose my fucking mind. I usher the students into a little coat closet out of view of the door, lock the door, and flick off the lights. To make it worse, me being a stupid college student at the time, I never had my phone charged. I send as many texts to loved ones as I can, trying not to alarm them, but letting them know I love them and something is happening at work before my phone dies. The students are also afraid, and about 30 minutes passes, I hear footsteps outside of the door and quite literally stop breathing, but they go past. I don't hear any shots or anything. 
Another 30 minutes pass, and I realize that I should call the front office to see if they have any updates. My brain goes stupid during emergencies, apparently. I forgot that classrooms have built-in phones during my panic. They answer like nothing is wrong, and I say something like, Hi, I'm a tutor here and have five students with me in XYZ room. Is it safe to come out? Are the police here? The woman doesn't answer for a little and dead ass says, Oh, did we not make an all-clear announcement? The drill is over. I was so close to tears and just hung up low L. Then an announcement is made that the drill is over. Nobody thought it would be important to let an outside school contractor know about a drill that very well could have been real. I swear I could have pissed myself. Count three. I spent some time in the peat swamp forests of Borneo studying wild orangutan. We would go into the forest very early around 4 a.m. One morning, there was a clouded leopard on the trail we used to enter the forest. It was just crouched there watching us. We shouted, tried to act big. One of the indigenous people we worked with even took out his slingshot and shot rocks at it. He missed on purpose just trying to scare it off. It stayed there for a good five minutes watching us before it slowly walked into the thick brush off the cleared trail. When we walked by, I shined my light to where it had walked to and could clearly see a pair of reflective eyes only three meters away crouched watching us pass. Creepy, but also incredibly cool to see one in person for how critically endangered they are. Account 4. I work for a medical examiner and used to be on the graveyard shift alone. The first night I was on at midnight on the dot, our air system shut off, which caused the vents to warp. That shit sounded like somebody running through the vents in the ceiling on all fours. Thankfully, I got used to it, Lowell, but deaf creepy at first. Another night, we lost power, and stupid me watching a horror movie working so hard almost shit my pants when everything went dark, and knowing that a room with around 30 dead bodies in it was walking distance away, that one I stayed in my car for not to mention the constant long, dark, red-lit hallways. Glad I'm not on overnight now. Account 5. Working on ships, there was one night I was on a ship sailing through Alaskan waters, and it happened to be my first night ever seeing northern lights. I can't believe how awesome that was. It made the sky clear, made the night look like it was dusk. We were able to see clearly for miles. Few buddies and I hit the roof, or what we call. Lido deck at 1 a.m. just to gaze at it. An hour or so in, there was six of us on top, nearly the entire crew now. A big white spotlight shines at us. We were near land, but where the spotlight was, was above the water, and it wasn't low enough to be on a ship. This was very high up. It shined on us for about 15, 20 seconds. Once the light turned off, we looked to see what it was. Saw nothing, no trace of an aircraft or anything. Couple minutes go by and the same light shined on us. This time it was on the other side of our vessel, above mountains. Still, unable to see what it was, we all saw it. We all have never seen any aircrafts hovering above these waters, especially at 2 a.m. We don't know what it was. We think it might have been some sort of silenced aircraft the military was probably doing drills or something. But anyways, that was one of the weirder things to happen out on the ocean. Account 6. I used to work out in the woods in Florida a lot. Creepiest thing would be this day we were working near Big Cypress, tromping through the brush all day. At the end of the day, my co-worker and I do a quick drive-through of some of the property and realize the place was absolutely infested with water moccasins. We had been unknowingly essentially walking around a giant water moccasin pit all day. That one kind of fucked me up. Account 7. We have a PTO pump spot that comes out of a canal for our rice fields. When I was like 12 years old, my uncle found two bodies dumped in the little sump area where our pump sat. Both of the ladies that were dumped there had the same tattoos, so they think it was gang-related, but it was 45 minutes away from where that gang operated. I still look in the hole every time I go by there, and that was 20 years ago. Account 8 used to teach outdoor education, which was essentially just summer camp during the school year, and school groups would come up and spend a few days at the camp. On their last night, we would always tell them a scary story around the campfire. 
It was the same scary story every time. We worked in partners, so there were always two staff members for every school group. One staff member would tell the story, and the other staff member would go hide in the forest and make scary noises. So I'm telling the story, and every few minutes there's like a snap of a twig or rustling in the bushes, and of course, as always, the kids all get freaked out and they start getting scared. It's very fun. Well, as I'm telling a story, I'm walking around the campfire looking at all the kids' faces, and I noticed a familiar one. My partner, Eric, sitting there smiling at me, wondering why I'm staring at him. My heart has never started beating so fast in my life. Eventually, I sped through the story and all the kids left, and I explained to Eric that I thought it was him in the woods, and his eyes got very wide, and he said, Are you telling me that that wasn't one of the staff members? So we both ran back to the main road. Account 9. I used to do salmon spawning surveys, which involved walking up streams looking for fish. Some of the streams are quite remote and or inaccessible on timberland, and you don't really expect to see any other person when you're out there. As a naturally smiley, friendly, small, feminine woman, I've learned to be wary of people 100, of the time in the field. I actively try to avoid running into people when I'm alone in remote places. One of the survey locations is close to a highway. To get to it, I had to park at a pullout, follow a river downstream to a flagged trail, hike over a ridge to meet up with an old logging road on private timber land. I walked along the logging road for about 100 minutes before peeling off into the woods, very thick second-growth Douglas fir reprode, where game trails eventually lead to the stream at the base of the hill slope. I came here during spring to survey steelhead. But this stream was also a survey location for other types of salmon during the fall. The game trails off of the logging road were flagged by previous surveyors, and multiple routes were marked. This made it kind of confusing, and not all routes actually led to the stream. Some just petered out once the vegetation got too thick. Another led to a cliff face overlooking the riverbed. Lots of faint trails. One day, I turned off into the woods, one of the survey flags tied around a branch at the side of the road. I followed some pink flagging heading south along the hillside. I noticed the trail seemed freshly turned up and figured maybe a bear clambered through recently since the time I was there last two weeks previously. The trail led to a small, claustrophobic clearing, and the ground was freshly torn up in the shape of a circle. Seemed strange. I was looking for elk tracks but didn't see any. Then I noticed an assortment of bones scattered around the edges of the clearing. These weren't there before. Everything was dead silent, and something about it was setting me on edge. I poked around the bones a bit, trying to piece together this scene. I noticed another slight path, which strayed from my main route, veering to the right from the clearing. I walked a bit down that way and gazed ahead, trying to see if this path was flagged. It was densely packed with trees. A subtle movement caught the corner of my eye ahead and to the right as I walked. I turned my head to look past the trees and saw the silhouette of a large shelter maybe about 50 feb and 75 feet from the clearing. It was surrounded by what looked to be jugs and bones. Tons of plastic jugs, light shapes of bones on the ground. The lighting made seeing anything else impossible. Everything was so, so quiet. I left in a hurry, off the trail, without trying to get a better look, without getting to the stream. The alarm bells in my brain were screaming. Account 10. I was serving as a fireman for my nation's compulsory national service. Once, we were called into the forest to retrieve a body who was found hanging on a noose, deep along one of the running trails. He had apparently committed suicide by hanging himself off a tree was found by a few morning joggers. What's creepy was we found a straw doll at the foot of the tree. It was stabbed with a few red bobby pins in the head, facial area, and there was also an unknown talisman that was half burnt where the doll was sitting. When we took the body down, we had to carry him a few kilometers out of the forest and halfway along the journey, a previously unnoticed wound on his face started bleeding. One of my man swearer that it was bleeding from the same spot as where the bobby pin was stuck on the doll, but we could not confirm it as we left the doll where his body was found for the police, 
passed the body to the paramedics, and booked our way out of the area. Account 11. Actually, I don't work in remote places, but when my father was sent to Alwar, Rajasthan, for archaeological study, I encountered a very strange thing. Our house was near a small forest. One morning, I saw a group of blue bulls, a kind of Asian antelope. They were five in number, and they were running in circles around a skull for like 30 minutes, and then one of them took it into the forest, and they all followed him silently. It was such a weirdo sight, it still gives me creeps. Account 12. I worked in a store once in a really small town that was always absolutely dead. A customer every hour or so shifts all alone too, which I'm sure wasn't even legal, but hey. Anyway, it's a dark evening, and I'm sat on Reddit as usual when I hear the door open. I look up and see the back of a man as he begins walking down the first aisle towards the tin foods, and he appears to be talking to someone on the phone, I think nothing of it, and go back to Reddit. All of a sudden, I get this intense smell of soil and earth. I look up, and the man's approaching the counter, and he's wearing some kind of overalls, and his face and long gray hair and body is just covered in dirt. That's when I notice he isn't on the phone at all, and is just talking to himself in this absolutely bizarre tone. He sounded like a cartoon elf or something. He's just sort of murmuring and doing this really weird hee-hee sort of laugh. I'm just frozen solid. As he stood at the counter in front of me thinking, I'm about to be killed. When a policeman storms through the door, he asks if I'm okay to which I don't respond because I'm just in a complete state of what the fuck is happening. Tells the man to come outside to which he starts murmuring gibberish and saying the words legal over and over again. They come grab the man and put him in the back of the police car. And that's the last I ever heard of it. I have no idea who he was, what was going on, but I have never been so afraid of another person before. You know when you just sense a bad, bad situation. So grateful the police showed up when they did. Account 13. I used to do agricultural work, alone in a field for 10 hours a day kind of thing. The pure amount of times I heard the sound of running, snapped up to see literally nothing. There was horrific. I was convinced it was surely animals between the trees for a while, but the weirdest moment was when I heard it loudly from a row of trees next to me, immediately ducked under to see the feet of whatever animal was running by, and there was absolutely nothing. I remember trying to stay calm and walking really fast to the toilet block and sitting in there for a good long while before I came back. I never thought I'd be so freaked out in the daytime, but there wasn't a soul nearby for quite a way. It really amped up my imagination. Account 14. I worked in a salt mine under Lake Erie a couple years ago, and generally speaking, when things are brought down, they're never brought back up. It takes a lot of time to disassemble everything up top, secure and cover the parts, and put it back together down below and vice versa so there's tons of old trucks, tractors, and countless other things lined up in the far side of the mine. Anyway, in the 80s, U of Michigan and Cal Irvine were studying proton decay and trying to capture measurements when it actually happened. Conducting this experiment topside is problematic because of cosmic rays and other forms of interference. So the mine was chosen as 2,000 feet of Earth absorbs pretty much everything. So they dug out a pool about 80 feet by 70 feet, filled it with 2,640,000 gallons of purified water and put fancy cameras and other equipment along the side. They had a whole shop, lab, and dive center down there. I don't think they ever captured a proton decaying, and eventually the grant money ran out after a few years. So the mine threw up some caution tape on the main steel door leading to the study, and that was that. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm working there as an electrician and I get a job to fix some big conveyor motor drive. So I set off and try to cannibalize some parts off old equipment. I remember one of the old timers telling me there's a bunch of abandoned equipment in an area by the Kepi lift, the main elevator. I get over there and find a big steel door falling if it's hinges with some very old caution tape laying on the ground. The whole study had to be accessed through this one door, which was dug into the wall, so after a while, the earth slowly crushes, bends, and pushes the ground up. After several tries, I yank the door open and step inside, only to shit myself and fall back when I see a full scuba outfit, wetsuit, mask, belt, 
gloves hanging three feet inside. So I collect myself, find that I didn't actually shit myself, how, I'll never know, and go inside, past the goddamn scuba dude. Everything inside was left exactly how it was left 20 years ago. Coffee cups left out, day planners, job schedules, along with tons of scuba gear, oxygen-filled tanks, and computers, I make it about 10-ish feet to the edge of the pool. And it's hard to see if the water's still in it because there's no wind to move it. But eventually, I see it's still there. 60 feet of pure water in an absolutely dark pool. The sight of a huge black pool in a huge black hole in the ground, lit only by the small amount of light my cap lamp put out. And the absolute silence of being underground made me really uncomfortable. So I left in a hurry. So that's my story. It's not particularly scary. But all that stuff sitting down there, nearly perfectly preserved in a, such an unexpected place, was always just creepy to me. Account 15. Not exactly at work, but my previous partner was an amateur industrial archaeology photographer, so we were often hiking to semi-remote locations to find abandoned factories, mills, storage facilities, etc. Being pretty far from civilization, they were almost always completely empty. We found syringes and trash in several ones that were closer to cities or towns, and once a homeless person living inside, but nothing ever dangerous or creepy, except once. This was a massive paper mill located over a now dry stream, pretty deep within the mountain. Think a couple hours hike away from the closest village. It was still in decent conditions, all things considered, but definitely abandoned. We'd been in less than half an hour taking pictures of the main building, which was still standing and had two exit points. One was the main entrance from which we had come in, and the other was the half. Collapsed door that led further into the factory, we were about to move deeper in when we heard what seemed like several dogs growling and barking aggressively. We figured it was probably another group of hikers with their dogs passing by, so we remained inside and after a couple minutes, the growling stopped. We got back at taking pictures of a peculiar pyramid, shaped mound of debris. When the growling started again, but much closer, I was starting to freak out as I thought it might be rabid dogs, and we had no way to protect ourselves. We tried to gather where they were coming from and move in the other direction, when suddenly the growls and barks turned into screaming, quickly getting closer. We were properly freaked out at that point and started running to the main exit, when a gigantic man covered in rags jumped in from the other entrance, yelling and screaming at us things we couldn't understand in what was surely not our language. We sprinted out of there like crazy and run back to the trail and didn't stop for a good five minutes before I couldn't keep up anymore and had to stop to breathe. We were terrified. But the man hadn't followed us outside the building and likely had no interest in pursuit once he got us to leave. Still, we did the two-hour hike back in a little over one hour as the scare definitely motivated us. In hindsight, it was probably just a homeless drug addict wanting to be left alone with his dogs and the language he had screamed at us in was likely a dialect, but the fact that we didn't see any other sign of anyone living there, no trash or clothes or food, and the ghost dogs, plus the remote location left me a very creepy impression of the whole encounter. Part 4 Account 1. Merchant seaman here? Nothing particularly creepy. Most of the time you're too focused on not hitting anything, getting position fixes, updating logbooks, etc., to really think about paranormal or spoopy shit. But the closest thing to creepy I've experienced recently has been a strange transmission over the radio. It started with a series of Morse code beeps, followed by an accented female voice listing off random letters and numbers. Don't know what the fuck that was about. Edit, I should clarify. It was definitely a numbers station, and obviously radio propagation is a thing, but this was off the Gulf of Mexico on a hot-ass day. Account 2. I do a lot of work out in the woods. Creepiest thing was finding some headless doves. I also found sticks arranged in circles and paint on the trees in the same spot. Not sure if it was part of a ritual or not, but that's what I saw. Edit. Okay. Lots of great points that it could have been just wildlife or cats catching the doves. That's totally possible. I've seen cats do that before, too. 
To add some more context, the type of doves found were not native to this area. It's possible they escaped or were released and had a run-in with a hungry house cat, and the painted circle of trees and sticks nearby was coincidence. Who knows? I certainly don't know what really happened, so it's all speculation. It's still the weirdest, creepiest thing I've ever found. Account 3. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp. Every week I had to take a big group of campers to a secluded spot for their wilderness survival badge, where they had to build a shelter out of sticks, leaves, etc., and sleep in it overnight. The spot was only about 1.2 mile from the main camp, but we took them a circuitous route that made it seem really secluded. Anyways, on this one night, all the campers had made their shelters. We had cooked dinner and were all just sitting around the campfire. It was getting late, maybe 11 Saturns, so I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night and started cleaning up the fire. That's when we heard in the distance what sounded like church bells. They were pretty faint, but myself and my fellow staffers could definitely hear them. They went on for about 30 minutes, ringing every 30 seconds or so. We were all a little creeped out, as there were no churches or towns within 20 miles of us. After the bells stopped, though, the singing started. It was too faint to hear the words, but it sounded like church choir music. But a lot of people, and a lot more enthusiastic. Also, it was almost midnight at this point. The singing went on for well over an hour, sometimes quieting down until we almost couldn't hear it, sometimes getting so loud we thought it was getting closer. All of the campers were super creeped out, but I lied to them, telling them there was a church service going on in camp and that there was nothing to be scared of. Eventually, at almost 1 a.m., the singing stopped. I found out a few days later that there had been a large KKK rally only a few miles away that night, and that's what we had heard. Account 4. I've camped near a river, and in the middle of the night I was convinced that I could hear people chanting, but I couldn't make out what. In daylight, I realized that it was just the sound of the river running over stones. I've often woken at 5 a.m. and imagined all sorts of things, but as soon as the sun rises, all fears go away. Account 5. I used to be a delivery driver, which doesn't sound very remote because it isn't. However, I did have to deliver to some pretty remote places. One time I delivered to a trailer park just barely inside our designated delivery zone, and it was very dark and poorly lit. I leave my car running and keep the headlights and inside lights on to go deliver the pizza. Upon returning to my car, I sit down in the driver's seat and look up to see a creepy old man standing less than three feet from my side of the car. He was just staring. It was the equivalent of a jump scare. I just started driving forward, had to do a U-turn to get out of the park. When I turned around, the man was standing in the middle of the road. So I freaked out for a second before speeding around him, only to watch him attempt to chase my car out of the trailer park. I put in my two weeks after that. Account 6. I was on a boat sitting on anchor in a secluded bay in the early hours. In southeast Alaska a few years ago, I stepped outside for a smoke, and all of a sudden I heard the most horrific sounds of a wild animal being murdered by another wild animal. It went on for probably ten minutes. I know it's just nature, but man. I can still hear that sound in my brain and it haunts me. Account 7. I was a field geologist in the outback about 12 hours north of Adelaide. One day I was driving the truck and saw what looked like a flagpole sticking up in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't anywhere near a farm or anywhere else that people would be. So I decided to drive over and check it out. It was a dead dog fully impaled on a spike. Like, from butt to mouth took some pictures and had my boss call the cops. But for the rest of the assignment, I was freaked out that some maniac was out there with me. Edit. I don't know if it was a domestic dog or a dingo or something. It was pretty well decayed when I found it. Account 8. I'm not sure if this counts because it's a farm. But when you live on a farm, you work on a farm. So I guess I'll tell it. I grew up on a farm, and in high school, used to mess with my friends by hiding and making them find me. One night my friend was over and we were waiting on this other guy. We see him pull up so we take off running to hide. It's funny because they have to wander around somewhere they're unfamiliar with or go ask my parents and be told too bad you'll have to find her. 
It's like forced hide and seek. Anyway, this one night I saw my friend hide in one building while I ran for the trees. I was hiding under some bushes and heard breathing, like human breathing. There were no animals around. It creeped me out so bad I ran out of hiding to greet my friend. I felt so uncomfortable for the rest of the night. Sometime during the night my dad heard something and went out to investigate. In the morning he discovered that one of our cows was killed and butchered. Account 9. I worked night shift at a prison for years. The one thing that really creeps you out is when a hit is put on someone in the middle of the night, inmate's code says it is kept as quiet as possible. No one says a damn word. The only thing you'll hear are grunts and moans from the victims. Then it goes and stays silent. If you hear it happening, it's already too late to stop it. It'll be over before you pull your keys out. Occasionally, if someone needs medical attention, the first sign we got was an inmate approaching the bars saying they need to go to medical E and are usually bleeding all nonchalant. The creepy ones are where no one shows up. All you get is grunts of pain and that's it. Account 10. Lived up north for a while on a three-year job. A local took me way out into the woods one night because he swore that at midnight, at this one spot, you could see the ghostly carriage where some people froze to death obviously expected to see nothing. So we're sitting there in absolute pitch black darkness. You can't see your hand in front of your face or anything around you. The sky is slightly, slightly gray from the thin cloud cover reflecting distant lights. But that's it. You can't even really make out the tree line. We never do see a carriage. Or anything. At about 12.20 or so, we're just smoking and chatting, thinking about leaving when we hear the unmistakable sounds of someone walking through the underbrush, loud crackling of breaking sticks and branches. But still, everything is black. It gets closer and louder, but we don't see anyone coming. There's nothing. And all we can think is how it's basically suicide to trudge through these woods at night. Good way to get a stick in the eye at the very least, and eventually you will twist an ankle or break something when you step off a ledge. The ground around here is very uneven, but it's definitely someone coming, crack, snap, snap. In the pitch black, nope, we drive the hell out if there. We weren't afraid it was a ghost. We were afraid it was a person insane enough to be marching through the woods without a light. Do not want to meet that guy. Update, for those of you comforting yourself, that it was just an animal. When I say, up north, I want you to imagine a place where you literally have to drive three hours to arrive at the closest city, and another three after that to get to the next one, and when I say noise, I'm not talking squirrels. Think rhythmic, and think large branches snapping on the ground. I'd been up there long enough to know what a possum sounds like. That big it might have been a bear, but a bear wandering around at night is not normal, which I suppose means it would have been pretty messed up. And that makes it worse, moose. Possibly, but those things are scarier than bears, no joke. They're the size of a truck. Use those antlers at anything that gets too close and disappear into the woods like ghosts. But we didn't hear hooves, so. Account 11. I used to work as an alligator hunting guide for trophy hunters during my summers, south of New Orleans, Spending sunup to sundown deep in the heart of Cajon Swamp territory definitely left me seeing some weird and creepy things. The first one that comes to mind is when I saw what my hunting partner at the time called the Lou Giroux. I personally would have called it a chupacabra, but that's because I'm a native of the Southwest, not the South. We were riding through an area deep in the swamp looking for signs of a big gator. The banks were close on both sides of the boat. There was barely enough water for us to push ahead. But those mud boats are impressive and can practically run on dry land, so onwards we pressed. Suddenly, I saw a gray flash in the trees out of the corner of my eye. It made me nervous. Swamp deer are small and shy. There's not many mammals that want to hang out in thick undergrowth and knee, deep mud and hidden gators. I tapped my partner's shoulder to catch his attention over the sound of the motor and pointed in the direction I saw the flash. He cut the motor and asked if it was a gator slide. I shook my head and said I had no idea what it was, but I saw something. As we were looking around us, the creature I saw stepped out from the trees. It was big on all fours. With mottled gray skin, its movements were janky, jerky. 
It had a canine-like face, and it locked eyes with me, and I felt sick to my stomach. My partner immediately struck the motor back up, and we reversed out of there as quickly as we could. My rational brain said, poor creature with mange, either a massive coyote or maybe a wild dog. But my primal monkey brain was screeching, monster, run or die. It was definitely a freaky experience, even knowing what it probably was. Account 12. My story isn't exactly what was asked for, but should be good enough read. In middle school, I worked at the school during the summer, doing general painting and helping the maintenance guys. We had to drive out to the fuck-off middle of a Floridian forest to pick up some pine lumber for the gym's new bleachers. And when we got to the mill at like 7 a.m., the whole place was locked down with police. They had found gasoline cans and pill bottles out in one of the tree farm groves, telltale signs of kids abusing substances. But supposedly the cops were there because they found human remains. I was pretty young, and I don't remember anything outside of my little kid point of view. But I remember seeing streaks of dark blood running up the trunks of several pines. I've since learned from the guys I was with then that a teenager was killed by a bear after attacking it. And the blood was either from the wounded bear climbing the tree or dragging a hurt person up with it. But I'm sure many of you can agree with me that bears don't do that. And I can't see an injured bear making it up several pines in a row while bleeding that much. So technically, I saw a creepy thing while at work in a remote area. Look up Lakeland Mill casualties or something to find it. The story of the kid's death was in the local paper. Account 13. I'm a machinist, and I was working by myself in this old warehouse at night. I would see stuff moving around, and I would get creeper out. This is when ghost hunters became popular. So I started to ask questions. What's your name? Can you show me that I'm not alone? Seconds later, a 3,8 Allen wrench came bouncing across the shop and landed at my feet. It didn't fall of the machine. It slid. I was cutting micarta, which is like wood, and you could see the slid marks in the chips. I said thank you to the ghost, shut down and left. I never went back. Account 14. I don't work out in the woods or anything, but me and my dad were hunting in the Porcinos. So me and my dad were sitting in a hunting tower. It was cold as balls out. And we start hearing what sounded like one of those old religious chants, where they sing all together in Latin while walking in a straight line. It kept getting closer, till we saw movement ab 20 meters ahead, and then we saw a group of Abbot 10 to 30 people wearing all white holding candles, and then Abbot 5 more people with rifles and shotguns standing in the front, the back, and on the sides. We let them pass, and they were staring at us as they walked by. It was scary as all hell. Apt 10 mins. After they walked by, we went over to where they were standing, and it was snowy out there, and there were zero footsteps in the snow, and till this day we still don't know what the hell we saw that day. Account 15. I used to be a delivery driver, but for a supermarket in the UK, a lot of our customers were in the middle of nowhere, and my last delivery of the night was a new customer I'd never been to before. I was already running late from all my previous deliveries, and I was still trying to find this house at 10.30 p.m., even though my shift was supposed to finish at 10 p.m. I'm driving around the narrowest of country roads with nothing surrounding me but dark fields and hedgerows, looking for anything that might be a driveway. I hadn't seen another car or person for miles. Then all of a sudden I hear a loud thud on the side of my van, like something was thrown at it. No trees or anything else around for something to fall from. And I remember it specifically hitting the side. I looked in my mirrors and out the window, but there was nothing around me. Then it happened again. Another thud on the side of my van. I drove back to the supermarket so fast and told my manager that I couldn't find the place. I had spent 30 mins looking to be fair. There was no house where the listed address, postcode took me. Part 5. Account 1. I don't work out in the woods or anything, but me and my dad were hunting in the Porcinos. So me and my dad were sitting in a hunting tower. It was cold as balls out. And we start hearing what sounded like one of those old religious chants, where they sing all together in Latin while walking in a straight line. 
It kept getting closer till we saw movement ab 20 meters ahead, and then we saw a group of Abbott 10 to 30 people wearing all white holding candles, and then Abbott 5 more people with rifles and shotguns standing in the front, the back, and on the sides. We let them pass, and they were staring at us as they walked by. It was scary as all hell. Apt 10 mins. After they walked by, we went over to where they were standing, and it was snowy out there, and there were zero footsteps in the snow, until this day we still don't know what the hell we saw that day. Account 2. I'm in the Navy and work on aircraft carriers. A girl sadly hung herself in one of the spaces right near where me and my shop slept. One person swore he saw her sitting in the chair as he was getting undressed one day and ran screaming out of the berthing. I waited about a week to go into the space where she hung herself, and when I did, I heard the loudest screeching noise I had ever heard in my life. I quickly turned around and got the fuck out of there. The system connected to where she slept didn't work at all for the next two weeks or so, too. The systems break a lot, so it was pretty coincidental that it happened just as she did this. Account 3. I spent a significant amount of time in the woods, and finding a body was also my biggest fear until my brother said, well, better that someone finds them, right? So as much as I still hope I never find a body, that is a more positive way of approaching it. At least the person would be found, hopefully identified, and maybe their family or friends would get some closure, etc. Account 4 not work-related, but while I was living in rural Australia, I went to a swimming hole with some friends. You have to walk down a rainforest trail from the road for about 20 minutes to get to the swimming hole. There were no other cars parked near the trail when we got there, and we didn't see anyone else the entire time we were swimming. Anyway, we were there in the late afternoon, and the sun was starting to go down, so we make our way back to where we parked our car. It gets dark by the time we make it to the road, and we have out phones out as flashlights. Parked right next to our car is an old camper van. Lights are off and the side door is wide open with no one inside. There's no one around we can see, so we're kind of spooked and quickly get in our car and start driving. We get down the road a little bit and see headlights behind us. The road ends near the swimming hole, so it must be the camper van following us. Thankfully, the lights turned down a side road before we got to the highway and we didn't see them again. Still wanted to check the car boot when we got home. Account 5. I do go hunting kinda north in Canada, and the thing is, where I hunt for deer there are plenty of wolves, bears, and the sorts, so I stay in a cabin up there. You aren't always on your toes, but you want to bring a rifle with you to go anywhere, even if you don't plan on shooting anything, so it's like 5 a.m., and I'm on the four-wheeler, I'm freezing weather to get to my tree stand before dawn hits, and I swear to God I keep hearing crashing through the bushes. I dismiss it for probably being ice cracking the branches from last night's snow, but creepy, nonetheless. As I reached my stand, I climb up and settle for the morning. I get a pretty nice view of a field that was cleared out, and there is an old, burned-out cottage on the opposite end of the clearing. As the sun rises behind my stand, the morning is very still, just the occasional branch falling down through the forest. Day really passed without any ammo being spent and a get out of my tree stand. And decide maybe I should go look at the burned down cabin. I've never bothered checking it. And looking at it all day got me curious enough to go check it out. There wasn't a cleared trail, obviously, so I'd have to go it on foot. I unloaded my rifle and went for a long walk. Around a good ten men later, I started to get close and could see some old farm equipment. Which made sense. A field in the middle of the forest was probably cleared so a farmer could do what he wants with it. I come close to the doorway, only really able to hear the crunch of snow underneath my feet. The doorway managed to survive whatever happened there and slid down the snow in through the doorway, careful not to touch anything and I feel crunch under my boots that definitely isn't snow. It's the skull of a bull. I look up from the snow, and there is more of them. Skulls and legs. A ridiculous amount. But the part that alarmed me is that I could see a tint of red in the snow underneath one that was still covered in skin. So I said fuck that and bolted back across the field and didn't look back. Why was someone collecting that shit in the middle of the forest? I don't have a clue and don't want to think about it. 
Next year I moved my stand and I never want to go back there. Weird shit happens in the forest. Account 6. I was at Large Old Cottage in the middle of the Peak District, UK, with a friend whose parents lived there but were away for the weekend. For anyone that doesn't know, it's a very barren place, full of hills, heather, and rains a lot. You don't see many people around. We'd spent the evening outside on her patio until it got dark and quite cold. So as we packing up to head indoors, her dog suddenly jumped upwards and just ran, as fast as I've ever seen it run into the field next door and into the darkness. No bark, no whining, just vanished. We called and she eventually came back. But she kept turning around and standing her ground, staring into the dark. A few minutes later, we saw these flashes coming from a patch of woods beyond the field. They looked like camera flashes, but it was too far away to tell. Twenty minutes later, we were inside and we locked the doors. A little unnerved by whatever the dog had spotted, it was late, and too late for what happened next. The house phone rang, and at that kind of time of night, you know it's never good. But my friend just froze and looked at me. I asked her if she was going to answer it, the incessant sound of it already creeping me out. She said, it only makes that noise when you've lost one of the handsets. I asked her what she meant, and she said, We have two house phones, one here and one upstairs. It makes that noise when you phone the other phone if you've lost it. It's an internal call. Nothing came of it. But I didn't sleep much that night. Account 7 not me, but a co-worker, used to work at a piggery. She said she would always see someone in the corner of her eyes. Boards would be written up like someone was checking on her sows for her. Things cleaned up, like someone was helping her. Apparently, she thought she was going mad and described seeing a dude around. And the others said, oh yeah, we think that's Ray. He died a while back at home. All the staff had seen him, but just sort of ignored it. Account 8 I was a Comcast cable installer. I went to this very strange house. From the front, it was a very long house. Ranch, like a cigar shape. I walked in the front door into a long room with a total of seven doors, all of which were locked. The owner must have come through one of them to let me into this main big room. On the floor on the right was a large tube TV. The kind one might get for free from someone throwing it out or at a goodwill. It was sitting on the floor. No furniture in this room at all. The man said to me I was not allowed to go any further in this house, nor go into the basement to hook anything up, and that he had already hooked up the cable line in the basement up through the floor, and that all I needed to do was put in the small box and connect it. While doing this, a door opened, and there was a young boy with a very sad look on his face. His clothes were dirty, tattered, and he looked hopeless. The man quickly snapped at him to lock the door, and the boy vanished as quickly as he opened the door. Suddenly the hair on my neck stood up and it felt like this was a trafficking pedo situation. There was no signal over the cable wire, naturally, and I asked the man to get into the basement to check and he adamantly refused. I explained he would have no cable, and he said fine in an angrily tone and basically threw me out. It was super creepy. Account 9 I used to work for an IT company in the gaming industry whose office was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by farms and forest. One day, one of the development team had come in from a walk in the forest and was visibly upset. Turns out she came across a dead fox. The thing that was concerning is that she said it was hanging from a tree and looks like it was put there on purpose. So a bit later on, a few of us went down to have a look. We came across a small clearing with the dead fox hanging there. Upon closer inspection, we realized it had been hung by its neck, with an incision from its balls to its throat and all of its insides pulled out. Felt pretty sick from that one. We got it down from the branch and chucked it into the bushes away from the path and clearing. Still to this day, we have no idea how or why it was in that state. Account 10. Could be one of two things. One, Sick fuck tortured an animal and hung it up? Two, I had friends who owned farms who would shoot varmints early in the morning and violently field dress them a little ways out from their property, making quite a mess in the process. That would sit out all day, making quite a stank, which attracted coyotes the following night. They would wait, hidden, 
downwind from the gory spectacle for the coyotes, and once they showed up to eat, they would shoot them. He hated the field dressing part, but it was required to keep their farm animals safe. Foxes would kill the chickens, groundhogs would kill crops, and coyotes would kill their goats. It was a gross but effective form of recycling. Account 11. My cousin was a deep water diver, welder on offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. When working at night or working really deep, it is absolutely pitch dark. You can't see anything. That in itself is a little creepy. To add to the uneasiness, he said that sometimes he would be hit with a big swirl of water as if something very large, very close, just passed by him in the blackness. Now let's take it up another notch. Sometimes he would feel something brush up against his leg or nudge him. He said his imagination would wander and never to a good place. Totally creeped him out every time. Account 12. I don't believe in ghosts. But I did see something once that I can't explain. And I have chalked it up to a trick of the brain. I used to work at a resort deep in Algonquin Park. It was basically rustic living for super rich people. It was a half-hour drive to cell service and an hour drive to the nearest town. I finished my late shift at about midnight. And I was walking back to my cabin. I clearly saw an elderly man with suspenders and a plaid shirt walking by me on the path. We were not allowed to speak to the guests, unless they spoke to us first, so I didn't say anything to him. It was pretty dark, too. I turned around to make sure he was headed the right way to the guest cabins, and he had straight up disappeared. There was nowhere for him to go except into the thick woods, and if he had done that, I would have heard it. Very strange. Account 13. A buddy of mine had a mine, maintenance, job for a summer. The mine was in the middle of nowhere and deactivated at the time. He was there was just one other person, a crusty old timer, and they didn't really do anything but keep the weeds down and make sure nothing was leaking or rusting out. It was a very low-key job. Twice a month, a plane would fly in to deliver supplies. One day, about three months in, my friend was just walking along the river that ran near the site, and he heard what he swore was like a church choir and organ music in the distance. He was pretty sure that there was no settlement within a hundred miles. But nevertheless, he decided to try to find the source of the music. He wandered miles downstream following the river, but the sound never got any louder. Finally, he decided to get the F back to camp, because he'd wandered off really far in bear-infested woods without any protection. The music faded before he got back to camp, and he realized that it was such a peculiar experience he was reluctant to mention it to his co-worker, in case he thought he was crazy. The following day, he did mention it, and asked if there were was an Indian reserve or some other settlement with a church in area. His co-worker replied, No, man, nothing like that here, and I've been here ten years. Looks like you're bushwhacked. You need to get out of here. He left on the next plane. Account 14. I used to work at a summer camp. Usually the kids would go to bed by 9 p.m. at the latest, so the rest of us would just hang out around a fire or something. One night, one of the kids came to the fire pit, which was about a hundred yards from the cabin, saying that she was having trouble sleeping because of the noise. So I walk back with her and make sure everything is good in the cabin and come back and tell everybody to keep it down. Maybe ten minutes later, she comes back and says that she still can't fall asleep. I walk back with her again, and in my head I'm thinking that she's just being restless because we aren't being loud. But anyways, I make sure she's under covers and head back to the fire pit. Just as I'm about to get there, I realize that I left my walkie-talkie in her room, so I head back and see that she's sitting upright in bed with the walkie-talkie in her hand. I'm thinking, okay, whatever, and tell her to go to sleep. I head back to the fire pit, and the guys are like, why did you say that to her? And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, we heard you on the walkie-talkie tell her that she would look better if she shaved her head, that all little girls look better with shaved heads. I never said that and nobody believed me, and it was obviously not her saying it either since it was a grown man's voice. I rushed back to check on the cabin and everything was normal. Account 15. I work in a restaurant that has a heavily wooded country park next to it. I used to live the other side of it and would drive around it to get to work. One particular day, 
I had car issues and had to walk to work. Going through the woods, as it's a 20-minute journey rather than an hour around. Anyway, no issues. Get to work, do my shift. Finish just before midnight. I'd planned to walk home the long way, but one of the girls who worked there lived near me and said she was just going to walk through the woods as it was quicker, so I thought, fuck it. Can't be that bad. I'll walk with her then. So off we go, into the woods. Surprisingly easy to see. It was a full moon. Beep. My watch chimed as it turns midnight. Ah, happy Halloween. She says, it dawns on me. I'm walking through the woods on Halloween at night during a full moon. Every time I watch a movie and someone does something dumb like that, I always think no one would be that stupid to do it in real life. Didn't get murderer, but I've never power walked so hard in my life. Part 6 Account 1 Random people coming out of the woods is something you don't ever get used to, really. I grew up on a drilling rig my dad ran. When I was old enough to stand up and steer a pickup between hay bales, I started doing that and pulling wells, oil well repair. With cell phones, it's a lot less common, but vividly remember skipping rocks at a pond and meeting a few rondos who broke down nearby looking for a ride. Account 2 I was in southeast Alaska for around 15 days a few summers ago. We had just finished up dinner and washed out our pots and pans and gone to our respective tents in the trees along the shore we had stopped at for the night. The spot we had chosen to camp wasn't ideal. The tide was set to come in pretty far that night, and it would only leave us with a few feet before the water would be lapping at our tent flaps. But we also didn't care that much as it had been raining and incredibly windy that day, so kayaking was hardly any fun at all, and we needed to stop. About 45 minutes after we had said goodnight to one another, I heard some splashing in the tidal zone, probably 20 feet from my tent. I didn't think much of it because a few times before when in Alaska we had stopped at beaches where the tide had risen to within a few feet of our tents. Anyway, I try to ignore it although in my mind I'm freaking the fuck out. Our camp spot was less than ideal if you wanted to escape in the middle of the night. We were at the base of a relatively steep hill that was covered in alders and slick with rain. To the left, probably 70 feet from where we camped, there was a rocky outcrop that went out into the water and was about 20 feet tall and steep enough that you couldn't climb it. If, for example, a grizzly bear. And there were a lot out that time of the summer. We had seen four or five that day alone, patrolling the beaches. Wanted to see what was going on down the beach and walked towards us from the right, it would basically seal off our movement, sort of like putting the cork back in the wine bottle, not many places to go anyway. After 15 minutes of hearing splashing, I start to try to rationalize it enough to go to sleep. But that's when I start hearing something other than splashing. This incredibly high-pitched gargling sound breaks through the night's relative quiet. It sounded as though two cats had gotten into a fight, but every time they let out a scream, the other cat would push the one cat's head underwater. This went on for a good 20 minutes. After it died down, I hear, that's weird, huh, from the other tent. Obviously trying to downplay the incident, I, being scared as fuck, just reply, yep, going to sleep. Another 15 minutes pass without much sound, but then the same gargling breaks through the night, this time much, much closer. The noises are deeper this time, more guttural. It sounds like an old man fighting with a cat. And each time either of them shriek, they are forced underwater. The splashing intensifies, and it sounds like it's right outside my tent. I think that the fear of whatever was going on eventually just zapped me of all energy, because eventually I fell asleep. I just remember that I didn't move a muscle, and I didn't move for so long that all of my muscles ached after a while, and I could feel my heart beat in my throat all night long. Anyway, we woke up, had breakfast, broke down the tents, and got back on the road. Didn't hear it ever again. A few weeks later, I did some Googling, and I'm pretty sure that it was just some sea otters fighting each other in the intertidal zone, but it was scary as fuck. I'll link the YouTube audio of the noises if I can find it, TLDR, lying in the dark in Alaska and hear guttural screams and what sounds like someone being drowned, in the pitch black in the middle of nowhere, 20 feet outside of my tent. Account 3. 
Archaeologist here, we had found a rural graveyard on USFS land in the middle of some mountain foothills in Nevada and had started recording some features of the site. We noticed there were these creepy little porcelain angel figures on top of the graves, meaning that these were not super old graves or at least were being somewhat maintained. We didn't have enough time to finish before sundown, so we wrapped it up and headed back to the bunkhouse. When we came back Monday to finish the site, all the angels had been systematically covered by old cow patties, like someone was trying to hide them from us. That meant A, people had been watching us that Friday afternoon, unbeknownst to us B, people didn't want us there. We called the USFS archaeologist we had been working with and she told us to finish and leave as quickly as possible. Account 4 I'm an avid hunter in a rural town in Missouri. My family hunts on public land and we have hunted on the same ridge for multiple generations. The land used to be kept by a large sawmill that used mules to drag the trees to the mill in the nearby town. We have found all sorts of crazy stuff, railroad spikes in the middle of the woods, horseshoes grown into the side of a tree where they hung it on a limb. One of the craziest things I've found in the woods was where a wagon had fell off the side of the ridge, taking the mules with it. It's something like 200 FT drop, so they just left everything down there. I hiked by this thing a hundred times going to and from our hunting spot. The woods all rotted from it, but the metal brackets and wheels were still there, grown over and taken back by nature. One day while walking in the woods, I get to my spot that is probably half a mile from that spot, and I've been sitting there for a few hours when I hear what sounds like people yelling down the ridge followed by a loud scream and a crashing sound. I grabbed my gear and start on my way out. When I get by where the wagon debris was a flower wreath laid over the wagon, but I've never seen anyone down there except for my family members, and no one knows who put it there. We talked about that night back at camp, and we could only assume that if someone had died in that wagon— Maybe it was some distant grandchild or something, and that day was the anniversary of it happening. But that still doesn't explain the sounds that I had heard. I still hunt down in the same place as always, but I've never heard or seen anything since. Account 5. I'm a geophysicist, and I'm out to do survey work about 1.3 of the time. A lot of our surveys are in remote locations. I was doing one in my home province of Saskatchewan, very far north, about a six-hour drive from the nearest small town, and then a 45-minute helicopter ride into our camp. It's isolated, and this survey began in October of last year, so it's quite dark a lot of the time. My room was on the attic of our only building, and the wood-burning stove that heated the place was directly below my room, so I often had to leave the window open at night. One night I had the window open and I could hear singing from outside, which was creepy, but I figured it was just a member of the crew who can't sleep. The next night, I hear the same thing. At the same time, about 3 a.m., and this time, I get up to go to the bathroom. Everyone else was sleeping in cots in a large open room, and when I'm heading back to my room, I realize that everyone is in their cots. I don't hear the singing again for a few days, and it stops creeping me out until about a week later, I wake up and hear it, I go to check, and once again everyone is in their cots. I put my huge winter jacket on, I head outside and walk towards the sound, I step right up to the shore of the lake that we're on, and I hear it coming from somewhere across the lake. The moon is up and very bright, and I see somebody in the lake, which is absolutely freezing, as in it has started to ice over. At this point, I am terrified, but I call out in case they needed help. They dive down under the water, and I don't see them ever again or hear the singing. It feels like a dream to this day. What the fuck? Account 6. While in the Marine Corps, everyone has a story or heard someone who was out in the field and saw weird stuff on knife, vice, and goggles. I was in Kuwait near the Iraq border. It is the middle of nowhere, miles and miles of sand. We saw some guy walking in the middle on the nigh by himself. I have no clue where he was going or doing. My guess he was hurting animals and lost one and was looking for it is probably as likely that he was a ghost. Account 7. I worked at a Boy Scout camp for two years in high school as a summer gig. A requirement for the scouts to earn their Wilderness Survival Merit Badge was for them to set up shelters among other activities. Before I was staff, 
The scouts would go 12-ish miles into the woods for their night out to a place called Shelby's Dream. The stories of kids waking up screaming, talking about seeing ghosts running at them, being hung from trees, and other wild experiences. Everybody wrote those kids off, called them crazy. Eventually, there were things people couldn't explain, such as staff members waking up with scratches and cuts on their bodies. The backstory of the place is that there was a mass killing of Southern soldiers, American Civil War, and Shelby was the daughter of the Southern captain who was hung with his men. She supposedly came back to the camp to find her father, and all his men hung from the trees. We stopped sending the groups to that location a few years back. One night, my cabin mates and I went out there to see if the rumors were true about that place. I heard voices, cries, and screams that echoed in the forest. There's a point where you cross a bridge, and once over the bridge, the wilderness stops. The woods continue, but there's no noise from animals or insects on that side. Absolute silence. That was one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. Account 8. When I worked in a kennels up the mountains... In the depths of winter, it would be dark by 5 p.m. I'd be in the office finishing up some paperwork. At this stage, everyone would be gone, and this particular building was a bit away from the main building, car park, etc. All the dogs would be sleeping by this time after a busy day. You could hear a pin drop. Sometimes I would hear heavy, definite, slow footsteps, so much so that I would get up, come out onto the main floor ready to explain we are now closed, but no one would be there. It used to freak me out a couple of times. I would even check the dogs in case it was coming from a kennel, but nope, all sound asleep. Account 9. One night I was driving out on a remote country round, and it was snowing pretty heavily. I got a call from my mom telling me to get home, as there was a pretty large blizzard, and the roads were only going to get worse. At a T in the road, I went to make a turn, only to see someone standing in the middle of the road in a light hoodie. With no houses around for about a half mile, I'm not sure why anyone would be walking out in a blizzard. As I swerved past, the person didn't flinch and looked right into my window. However, it was too dark to make out a face. It stopped snowing shortly after I got home, and the next day I went back out to the road to see if I could find any traces. I could clearly see my car tracks. But there were no footprints anywhere. It definitely could have been some kook out for a late night hike but it was still pretty creepy. Account 10. So in college, I'd wait for my roommate to get off of work at the new parking garage my campus built. He was a security guard on the night shift. Nothing too crazy most of the time. But one day he finished his shift, and I told him I'd meet him outside. He leaves the garage and says, I don't think you're going to believe me when I tell you this. But I have to tell someone while it's fresh in my mind. The next part is how I remember him telling me while we sat in the car. I was in the office chatting it up with the custodian when he pointed to the security camera screen and told me there's a guy in the stairwell. We both looked at the camera closely, and sure enough, there's a guy just standing on a landing in the stairwell in an old-timer suit, bowler hat and everything. The security guard told me he'd start cleaning at the bottom of the stairs, and if he saw the gentleman, he'd tell him to leave. I told him I'd come up the landing and do the same. I didn't see him on my way to the landing, so I made my way to the stairs while calling out that the garage was closed for the night in case he was hiding. While walking through the stairwell, I startled the custodian because he was expecting to see Mr. Suit as well, but no one left the stairwell at the bottom. I told him I had to check out the rest of the grounds, and that maybe he slipped out another way. Even though there was really no way either of us could have missed him, I'm approaching the ramp of the next-to-last landing of the top of the garage, and I see an older woman in an old-timer dress and umbrella. She's going up the ramp in the distance, I yell. She shouldn't be up here and swiftly pick up the pace before I lose sight of her going to the top level. As soon as I arrived to the ramp, she was ascending. I don't see her. I got to the top of the ramp and see a kid skateboarding on the last level of the garage. I tell him the garage is closed and he shouldn't be up here, but at the same time wondering where that woman went. The skateboarder apologized and said he'd walk down with me if that would be okay. We get to the bottom and I say, Hey man, you see anything weird at this garage tonight? The skateboarder looked at me with the most confusing stare and said, well, 
There was this older woman standing at the edge of the garage, and I didn't see her come up the ramp. I screamed she should be careful not to get too close to the edge. I went to pick up my board, and when I looked up, she was gone. I ran to the edge to see if she jumped, but nothing. She was gone. She was wearing this old-looking dress and umbrella. I didn't want to tell the kid I saw the exact same woman because I was too freaked out. I suggested that it was probably a costume party and some people were messing around. I couldn't explain the disappearances, though. He said he thought the same thing, but he remembered his boss telling him that years ago, 20s era, people would dress up in their Sunday duds and walk through the park in town. The park was right where this parking garage was. Account 11. I used to work as a tree planter and have spent thousands of hours in the deep woods. To be honest, there is nothing creepy in the forest other than carcasses and the sound of animals. But I will always say that the forest is alive, and you need to respect it because in the woods you're on nature's terms. If you don't, the forest will disrespect you back. It is very easy to become lost and disoriented without a compass, and there are many perils that the woods can manifest to injure, maim, or kill you. Don't fuck with the woods. Account 12. Probably a little too late to the party, but here we go. I've seen a few things working in remote locations on land and working oil rigs, platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, but I definitely think the eeriest was the one I never saw, but heard the countless stories from the people who had to investigate it. On a platform offshore, a man went missing during his nightly rounds. After searching the platform top to bottom, they found his hard hat, tool belt, work boots, and all his personal shit neatly placed on the grating near the railing, and he was M.I.A. Everyone has their stories of maybe it was just suicide. Because as it turns out, living on a metal structure surrounded by water for weeks at a time takes its toll on you. Some people have their theories. He found out his wife was cheating on him at home. Some people even think it was nefarious and someone made him do it because he was having an affair with their wife. The oil field can be a dark place, both mentally and physically. All I know is jumping into the dark abyss of the ocean and letting the waves swallow you up is a terrifying concept to me. Second story happens along a dead stretch of highway around 3 a.m. I was making the drive back home from the docks, and around 3 a.m., I started getting so exhausted it was getting unsafe for me to drive. I was falling asleep, slapping myself in the face and sticking my head out the windows, trying to do anything I could to stay awake and make it home, but nothing was working. So due to the time and location, there wasn't any safe places I could park to get a little bit of rest. So in my sleep-deprived state, and I figured since I hadn't seen anyone else on the highway with me, I'd just pull over to the side of the road and get some rest, I leave my truck running with the lights on and set a alarm for 45 minutes. Well, on that truck, when you put it into park, it automatically unlocks your doors. Thank God. Right before I fell asleep, I had the presence of mind to relock all my doors because about 10 minutes before my alarm went off, I woke up to the sound of the door handle on the rear passenger's door on my truck getting repeatedly yanked on and it was shaking the whole truck. Needless to say, I was awake now and full of energy. All I can remember from the adrenaline dump that happened was I slammed the truck in gear and did probably the best burnout that truck has ever done and threw rocks and smoke at whoever was behind me the rest of the drive home. I remember swerving left and right trying to make sure if someone was in the bed of my truck that I'd knock them out. I think the creepiest thing about that whole ordeal for me is there isn't a way for me to prove that it happened. At the time the incident happened, I had been awake over 24 hours. But I've also heard instances of that happening to people on that stretch of road. Call it a ghost. A dream or some kids playing pranks on the poor people passing through town. But all I know is I'll never fall asleep parked on the side of the road again. Account 13. I don't work in a remote place, but I have a house out in the middle of nowhere that I rarely ever get to see. The town has a population of roughly 30,040 people, all of whom have acres and acres between each other. My in-laws who live nearby have had been noticing at least two or three of their chickens missing every other day and assumed it was a fox, the usual. Anyway, one night myself and my wife are doing a bit of work on our fences around our land, and we hear this thrumming noise coming from the adjacent acreage, which is completely overgrown. You can't even see through it, let alone walk through it. 
The only way I can describe it is like a cat purring. But you know, a fucking massive cat. The entire bushland seemed to reverberate with the sound. Needless to say, we made a hasty retreat and try not to go out at night when we're there, more so than we did before due to all the undiscovered mines. Account 14. I've spent quite a bit of time in remote areas both for my job, wildland firefighter, and recreationally. Never seen anything really weird, but the creepiest thing I've seen was near one of our prescribed burn units in the middle of nowhere. We used to regularly see the same truck out there driven by the most stereotypical creepy-looking dude you could think of. Always with a different, much younger woman in the passenger seat, we of course reported him to local law enforcement, but I moved to a new job shortly after, so I don't know if anything ever came of it. Account 15. When I was in college, I interned with the Forest Service. A lot of the time, I just spent patrolling hiking trails. Right near Grandfather Mountain, I thought I heard someone yelling for help, but my supervisor told me to ignore it. Apparently, someone went missing in the area in the 60s and was never found, and people would hear that voice all the time. I heard it twice more after that, and it always creeped me out. Part 7 Account 1 My buddy went to Singapore for his military jungle training. He was woken up for his guard shift and noticed a foot, long, very venomous, centipede, curled up on top of his sleeping bag. He was trying to stay calm. And then his ice, for Blood Buddy reached down, grabbed the thing by the head, walked outside, and chucked it into the forest. Apparently, the last thing he heard while the guy was walking outside with the little arthropod's head clamped in his fingers sounded like a hissing noise. Account 2. I was walking with my cousins about 14 years ago when we found what looked like an old burned-out house. So naturally, being kids at the time and having no sense of self-preservation, we decide to explore it. Mostly, it was just full of charred wooden crap and junk, but then one of my cousins found an entrance to a cellar outside. We busted the old rusted lock off the door and looked down inside. It was dark down there, and we didn't really have any reason to go poking around it. Plus, we were starting to get creeped out, so we kicked some dirt down into it and walked off. When we get about 15 yards away from the house, one cousin says he hears a noise, so we stop. And yep, there was noise like somebody coming up the rotting cellar stairs of the house. We peek back through the trees and see a dark kind of fuzzy shape crawl out of the cellar, which we left open. It looked kind of like a big old dog, and then it stood upright. We hauled fucking ass out of there. We all ran off in different directions like morons, each of us convinced whatever the cellar thing was was chasing us. I ran right through some briars in a panic and tore my arms and legs all up, which got me in trouble when I got home. We were all fine otherwise, but we did avoid going that far back into the woods after that for a long time. Closest thing I can figure is there was a small black bear living in the cellar. Maybe it had another entrance we didn't know about, and we woke it up being little assholes, but seeing something hairy and dark come out of that cellar then stand up was like being in a horror movie. I never want to see that old house again. Account 3 I collect data on electrical systems, power lines, poles, transformers, etc. My last project spent a lot of time in the high Rockies. Most of my days were spent far from cell phone service and society. We often joked about being stalked by mountain lions only to lighten the mood, because we were probably constantly being stalked by mountain lions. Account 4 I lived in remote CO studying sage grouse. I was way the fuck out there by myself and no cell service. One day I was particularly deep walking plots and looking for bird shit. It was starting to get dark, so I headed back to my four-wheeler. To my surprise, the key was missing, and there was a 30 Thomo 6 shell just sitting there. Fuck, I was prob 3, 4. Hike out to my cabin and it was getting cold and dark fast. After about an hour, I found the key in some shrubs. As I drove off, I heard a very close-by gunshot. The whole experience was terrifying. I assume it was some poacher just fucking with me, but damn it took the CO wilderness fun meter down a whole lot. Account 5. I work a forest ranger in the States. 
I've seen some creepy things, but nothing like this one bear that used to stalk me, and some of the other hikers in the area. It didn't act like any other bear. It would just follow you. It would try to hide in a bush or someplace elsewhere behind you. It didn't do anything. It would just follow you. Turns out it was a dude in a suit who only got caught because he attacked the wrong redneck. Account 6. When I was in the Navy, I saw a UFO. A lot of people will tell me, no, it was just some weird lights. But nothing created on the planet Earth moves the way this did. It was just getting dark outside, underway at about 10 kts in the Mediterranean, dead flat seas. I'm sitting watch up on the bright bridge console when I notice a single point of light in the air. To me, it's what looks like a helicopter hovering above one of two merchant vessels in sight. I check the AIS and get the names of the two vessels and relay that information over to our TIC IDS. It's not incredibly uncommon for a merchant vessel to have a helicopter on board, but there is absolutely no signal coming from the bearings I was giving, and no record of either ship having a helicopter. At this point, I started to get more concerned and curious. The point of light is still hovering above one of the ships. I head out to the port bridge wing and get on the big eyes high power mounted binoculars to see if I can get a better look at the aircraft. It appears to be at least 11 nemeter away. And even with the magnification, all I can see is a single point of light. At this point, the OOD is interested as well and joins me on the bridge wing and we watch this point of light zip 15 nenami in a matter of 2.3 seconds and stop directly over the other merchant vessel. There was no wind-up acceleration, it just went from hover to full speed to full stop instantly. The officer standing with me was completely speechless and in awe at what just happened, and called for a higher power air radar search on that vector. Still nothing at all. The point of light hovers above the ship for a minute or so, then at about half the speed from before flies to a point between the two vessels over the open ocean. It makes three, four dips down to the water and then back up to about 10,000 feet. Then it started to make an infinity loop pattern in the sky. It was dropping from around 10,000 to 2,000 feet and back up at an incredibly rapid pace. No human-made aircraft is capable of this amount of precision, acceleration and deceleration, or speed. Before the two of us could even react, the craft blasted across the sky at a slightly upward angle, completely silently, leaving no trail or trace at thousands of miles an hour before disappearing into the open sky. The officer of the deck standing next to me had his mouth wide open, eyes practically bugging out of his head behind the binoculars. He looked at me and said, Red Clam, what in the fuck did we just see? To which I replied confidently, We just saw a UFO, sir. We reported it to CIC as a glare on the windscreen of the bridge, that we messed up, ha ha. But we know what we saw with our bare eyes. The two vessels involved got underway a few minutes after our report, each heading back towards the coast at 15 knots. Along the exact same track, I lost track of the vessels when I got off watch four hours later. But I've always been curious about them and where they ended up. TLDR. The officer of the deck and I saw a UFO while on watch in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Account 7. I grew up in San Jose, California. My friends had jeeps. SJ is sounded by foothills. Well, we would trespass all the time. One time we are in the middle on the Santa Cruz foothills. On some flat part of a hill taking a piss, it's like 2 a.m., and we hear some lady singing in a weird language. And it went on for a bit, so my friend was done taking a leak. He's standing by the jeep, and the small trees and bushes shake, and this younger woman comes walking through holding a baby, and she was rubbing the baby's head. All weird. I couldn't tell if the baby was alive, but she walked right past us like we weren't there. It was next level creepy. Account 8. I grew up in Michigan before it was fashionable to kidnap the governor. Backpacking in the Pigeon River State Forest happened multiple times every year. On one fateful trip, we had closed down for the night. We're enjoying the campfire and listening to the night noises. Our campsite was up on a bluff away from the river. I should mention that the experience was nicely enhanced by smoking the devil's salad. All of a sudden, we could hear something walking effortlessly through the water. We froze and looked at each other, eyes big as saucers, knowing our time had come. 
we quickly realized that whatever was moving through the water was not one, but many. Certain that we were dinner for a whole family of Sasquatch, we did a military crawl to the edge of the bluff to identify our killer. Through the moonlight, we could see the elk herd casually walking by the campsite as they headed to wherever they were going to bed down for the night. We watched in silence as those beautiful animals moved so graciously through the river. After they left, we walked back to our campfire and laughed uncontrollably as we tried to accuse each other of being the most scared that night. I think of that experience from time to time and smile from the memory. Thanks, OP, for bringing it to mind again. Account 9. Used to own a horse boarding and training farm with about 45 acres surrounded by woods. I used to spend the night there quite a bit because I had to start chores early in the morning, so if I stayed too late, it wasn't worth it to drive home. One night at about midnight, my dog started to bristle up and growl at the door of the office I slept in. And then my iPod, which I kept on a speaker in the middle of the barn, started blasting out Johnny Cash's ring of fire at full volume, which I definitely hadn't left it on. Let me tell you, that song is fucking freaky as shit in the middle of the night, like shit your pants freaky. My dog was full on growling and barking at the door, so I cracked it and let him run out. Figuring that if someone were in or around the barn, he'd get them. Anyone there would have been trespassing at that time of night. After a few minutes, I went out of the office into the barn aisle with a bat to turn off the creepy-ass music. The light I usually kept on so I could see around was off, so it was pitch dark in most of the barn. My dog was just staring out the barn door, which I kept open in the summer to keep the horses cooler, with his hair bristled but wasn't leaving the barn, which he was allowed to do. I wrote it off as creepy as fuck, but ultimately just one of those things, you know, like it's weird and I can't explain it, but there's got to be an explanation I'm just not privy to. But the real scary part is that my property shared a private gate in back with the property closest to mine, which had a gate at the back. Most of my property was fenced because of the horses, and the property next to mine was like dozens of acres fenced with a chain link fence, which if you know anything about rural fencing is not done. Anyways, we found out later that the owner of the adjoining property was Todd Colehep, the South Carolina serial killer. He had a woman chained up like a dog on his property, who he and his friends would rape and walk around the property on a leash. He also had some bodies of people he killed buried on his property. He was doing all that stuff while I lived next to him. In fact, I used to ride on his property but would always turn around if I heard machinery. In retrospect, probably burying bodies or got the creeps, like something would tell me to turn around and go home. I was probably one of the few, if not only, person besides his friends who were raping the woman to go on his property while all that was going on. Account 10. Not me. But my dad's co-worker, stretching the definition of work here, but I think it fits. Anyways, in the Vietnam War, this guy was part of a special forces outfit who were dropped into Laos or Cambodia to map the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Out of a group of about 20, only three or four made it out. At one point late in the operation, he was separated from the rest of his squawmates and was trying to find a river to follow back to a U.S. outpost. He said something they were always taught was to keep their rifle in their hands at all times and never set it down. After a few days of no supplies and avoiding Viet Cong, he hears the sound of rushing water and as silently as he can, makes his way toward it. After coming through some trees, he finds a river that he recognizes and immediately has this mental celebration in his mind of, thank God I've made it, and in his haste to get some water in his dehydrated system, sets his rifle down, he said he was guzzling water when all of a sudden he hears this snapping sound, like a branch cracking directly behind him, he said he immediately closed his eyes and prepared for a bullet to enter his skull. After a few seconds pass, and he isn't departing the world to meet his maker, he opens his eyes and slowly turns around. Five feet away, a Buddhist monk is standing in the middle of the jungle. The monk raises a finger to his lips and beckons him to follow. Turns out, a monastery is nearby, and the monks were sympathetic to the U.S., they ended up sheltering him for a few weeks until they got him back to U.S. forces. 
Crazy enough, years later he ended up running into the same monk that saved his life at a remote Buddhist temple in the U.S. They remained friends until the monk passed away from cancer. Account 11. I worked at a state park for a few years. One day a co-worker was doing trail maintenance, and a human skull rolled out of the woods onto the trail in front of him. Turns out it was a man who had been on the run from the police and was living in our woods. Evidently, it was a good hiding place because they hadn't found him until then. Account 12. I work in a secure area in the forest, and I once saw two troops of monkeys having a war and watched as one group realized halfway they could kill the other much faster by throwing their rivals at the barbed wire. Account 13. I do mineral exploration in Alaska. I'm often transported by helicopter to very remote regions throughout the already very remote state. A few years ago, my field partner and I came across what seemed like a bear kill of a caribou carcass. But when we got closer, it seemed odd. The only things that remained were two spines and one head. The head was arranged such that the mouth was wide open, pointing up like it was screaming towards the heavens. The eyes were cut out. Very weird. There's also been many instances of coming across old miners' buildings littered with dog skeletons or having strangely new children's clothing strewn about. Account 14. I work in northern British Columbia doing bush grinding. My brother and I go in after the logging companies and grind all the leftover piles of wood into trucks to take to the mills for wood pellets. Back in February of this year, we were on night shift about three hours from the closest town, and the few locals that lived out there warned us about a pack of timber wolves that was about 25 strong and oddly fearless. It was about three in the morning, and we had worked our way down the block road about half a mile, and one of us needed to walk back to the pickup truck to bring it closer to fuel up the machines. Of course, I drew the short straw and went for a walk. Not even halfway to the truck, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I felt like I was being watched, so I swapped my flashlight beam across the tree line, and all the eyes watching me lit up. Of course, I left my shotgun in the truck, and I didn't think running was a wise idea, so I kept walking swiftly while focused on the tree line, watching the eyes follow me the rest of the way back to the truck. I got to the truck fine and obviously never left it too far away again. I've had many creepy and interesting encounters in the bush, but this one was definitely one of the oh shit moments. Account 15. I was about 14 years old when my dad went away on business for a couple weeks, leaving me to tend the farm by myself. Mostly just feeding horses and chickens, not a big deal. Farm was way outside of town and down a dirt road. Nearest neighbors were two pastures away and my dad insisted on never locking the doors. After the first few nights, I started hearing tapping on the windows late at night, so obviously I broke Dad's rules and started locking the front and back doors. Then the window, tapping advanced to doorknob, rattling. And then I started finding odd things around the farm while doing chores. One morning I found the horses stuffing themselves in the hay storage stall. The latch for that stall was very stiff and a little complicated, so it had obviously been opened by a person and not the horses. The worst morning, I stepped out on the back porch and found all the chickens sitting in a row along the side of a shed, evenly spaced, with their necks broken. One or two were still moving a bit. They looked set out on display. The chicken yard latch had obviously been opened by a person and left open. The worst part of all of this was when my dad finally came home, blamed me for every bit of oddness and disaster, and acted like I was stupid for being scared. He insisted that the horses open the hay stall latch and that the dogs were responsible for the open chicken yard and line of posed, broken, necked chickens. I think it's worth mentioning that our next-door neighbor was well, known for being batshit crazy. Documented bits of crazy that my dad was entirely aware of included putting bear traps in his haystack to catch the kids who had been playing in it and blocking off a neighbor's driveway with a load of dirt as revenge for not letting him ride his horses on their property. So my guess is, batshit crazy neighbor could see that my dad's vehicle was gone, could hear my music turned up in the distance across the pastures, and figured terrorizing a middle school girl would be a fun hobby for a couple weeks.